Well, good morning. So as uh, prayer said, I'm Reagan Gilliland. I'm the pastor of adult discipleship, and I'm actually normally over in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. Like I sometimes get down the hallway a little bit, but usually I have no time between services. But it's always such a treat um, to be here with you in modern service. And I'm so thankful that Stephanie gives me the chance to to rotate in here ever so often. Um, So today we are in stewardship and we're talking about serving. And so I wanted to start um, by telling you just a couple things about me. Some of you may know I've got two kids, Andy Jane, who's five and a half, and my son Jude, who is two, and he's very two, in case you were wondering. Um... And my daughter, Andy, started kindergarten this year. And since starting school, she has started to talk more and more about what she wants to be when she grows up. Now, for a long time, she only talked about being a potions scientist, probably influenced from Harry Potter. I'm not sure how I feel about her, like, really loving Snape, although Snape is a very neutral character. I have to tell myself that. He's not evil. But she really, really talks about being a potions scientist. But now that she has started school, she really wants to be a teacher, probably because she really loves her kindergarten teacher. Um, But we told her, well, you know, you can actually teach potions to other people, so you could actually do both. And she said, oh, I like that, which is great. But she also has mentioned that she wants to be an astronaut. And I thought, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to squash her dreams but I don't know if she can be all those things, right? A teacher, a potion scientist, and an astronaut. Because I don't know if you've looked up what it takes to be an astronaut, but some would say it's a little difficult, (laughs) just a a little bit. But then I read about someone like Johnny Kim. Do you all know Johnny Kim? So in case you were feeling good about yourself, I'm going to ruin your day. So he is a Navy SEAL, a Harvard-educated doctor, and then was selected this past summer to be a NASA astronaut that will uh, prepare for moon explorations in 2024. And he's just 37 years old. So I was thinking about my life, and I was like, wow, I've done nothing in it. So thanks, Johnny. Um, And I was thinking, I was telling my husband about this. He's like, yeah, can you imagine being like an ex-girlfriend of his, like, or being the mother of the ex-girlfriend, thinking, well, you could have married Johnny Kim, but she had to break up with him, right? So why do people like Johnny have to ruin it for the rest of us when we were feeling good about something we accomplished? But it got me thinking about how many of us would probably would like to be like Johnny with all these accomplishments and being kind of thought of as one in a million. But obviously, he had to do a lot of work to get to where he is. Being a Navy SEAL is... I imagine not a walk in a park, Harvard-educated doctor, and now an astronaut. He had to work really hard to get to where he is. And sometimes we can be guilty of only wanting the paycheck, the title, the fame, but not necessarily wanting to do the work it requires. The disciples also had this same sort of struggle because they didn't quite understand what Christ was asking of them in order for them to follow him. So we're in week two of Stewardship Series, and we're talking about serving. And today we're going to be looking at a a couple passages from the Gospel of Mark. Um, I believe you were in Mark last week, and you'll be in Mark next week. Uh, But we're going to be looking at Mark 10 to begin, um, verses 35 through 45, which says this. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Man, that's a bold. <laughs> and he said to them, what is, it, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to, said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. And then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but is for those who whom it has been prepared. 
When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be a servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So you may be asking, wow, that James and John, that took some gumption (laughs) to ask Jesus for something like that. And the the disciples seemed pretty mad about it. And I don't know if it was because um, they thought, I didn't know we could ask that. Did I miss my chance? I don't know that was an option for me. So are they like, could I get a pool? Could I get a, the penthouse? Something like, are they like trying to scramble? But the thing is, they were angry because this wasn't the first time there had been conversation about asking for glory. And the first time, Jesus was not a big fan of it. And true to the nature of the disciples, they hadn't learned. Back in Mark 9, 33 through 37, the disciples had asked about it, and I'm actually going to read it. It's probably a fairly familiar story to you because there's a part of it that we love to teach about kids. But this is Mark 9, 33 through 37. When they came to Capernaum and when he was at the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? This is Jesus asking, but they were silent, the disciples (laughs) For on the way, they had argued with one another, who was the greatest? I mean, really, they're with Jesus, and they're trying to argue, like, who's the greatest among them? He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it on his ar- in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. So it seems like the disciples are really, really fixated clearly on glory, power, recognition, and praise. And it's not like they learned it from Jesus. Jesus didn't go around asking for those things. Often he was quite quiet about who he was. And so why are they consumed with it? Why, you know, how did they learn this? Again, Jesus didn't have this elaborate life. He was a nomad. He didn't have riches. He wasn't this warrior. He came to us as a baby. He was this regular Joe that just happened to be God. So why do these disciples want celebration and honor and recognition and power? Well, sadly, it's part of our human condition because we have, we all have that desire, right? We all have the desire to have power and glory and recognition And the disciples, when you read along their story, they seem to have really selective hearing. When they talked, when they heard Jesus talking about rising, they got really excited about that glory part, that rising, even though they also didn't quite understand that either. But they seem to not really listen to the part about the suffering that would have to happen first. That there was a lot of work to be done, that there was going to be abandonment, that they would be run off like out of town they'd be chased they'd be threatened to be killed many of the disciples ended up being martyrs they'd be ostracized they would go hungry they'd be shipwrecked they'd be beaten all those things the glory that they wanted wasn't going to happen like they envisioned or desired so the disciples even though they had been learning from jesus they grew up in an age when those in power demanded to be served to be uplifted to be praised to be worshipped at whatever cost, usually to the detriment of the common person. Everything was about serving that leader. Now, Jesus even talked about that in Mark 10. He talked about how rulers lord it over people and that tyrants, they're tyrants over them. See, Jesus, he wasn't like that. And the disciples maybe struggled with that. They probably thought, Jesus, why don't you flex your power a little bit? Just use it, do your thing. Make those people bow to you. Make them worship you. Make them give you food. Make them give you a place to eat. Make them give you riches. Jesus was so opposite of every person and leadership they had ever seen. 
So I imagine if Jesus were to show up today and try to establish himself as a leader, we probably wouldn't even notice unless he made some really killer TikToks and got a ton of followers. Other than that, under the radar, right? Because he didn't go around demanding people to follow him and see him and recognize him. It, I mean, the invitation was for them. It was their decision. But he wasn't like the rulers of that time because Jesus came to serve and not be served. So this next part, I want to talk about two groups of people that Jesus said to emulate when it came to serving. At least a couple of things that came to mind as I read through scriptures and thought about what Jesus talked about, who he referenced a lot. So Jesus references children in that Mark 9 passage. Now children at this time were, you know, they had no rank at all. They were pretty low in the totem pole. pole. Children were not necessarily valued or respected. In some commentaries, they talk about how children were sometimes lived in separate living quarters from their family, especially their dads. They weren't led into places of value or honor. They were mainly used to help around the house and complete chores. They were somewhat of a glorified slave at times. But I want us to think about children in their most pure form when they help, when they serve. Kids, in my opinion, serve out of this genuine love. They love their parents, their friends, their grandparents, their siblings, most of the time, (laughs) their teachers. And so they want to help because they don't have some alternative motive. They don't have some other motivation. It's just this wonderful love that they have and they want to spend time with people. And I know some of you parents may be thinking, no, my kid's motivation usually is money or something like ice cream or something. And so it's not a perfect 100% all the time. But I do think that there's a time in all of our lives when we are young, where our motivation is so pure and so loving. We aren't looking for reward or praise, but out of this deep, authentic, and genuine love. And there's no sense of judgment from kids. They don't think that they're better than other people. They just want to make sure people feel loved and appreciated. And maybe you think I'm too optimistic or I'm living in la-la land, that people could be this pure. But I think we're kind of called to live like that. I think a challenge Jesus has for us is to love others. He's pretty clear about that. And one huge way to love others is by serving them. The other group that Jesus often referred to was becoming like a slave, having um, the mindset of a slave or acting as one. And there's a couple layers to this. First of all, slaves were literally at the very bottom, right? They couldn't walk around and think they were better than anyone else because they weren't. They were told they weren't. And the way society was set up, it was pretty horrific for them. And so there's a reason that Jesus said to be like them. I think Jesus walked around and realized that all these groups were thinking they were better than others. And so he wanted to fix that mentality. He'd seen how there was this lack of helping others and reaching out to those on the margins because everyone, everyone was walking around thinking they're better than everyone else. I'll never forget a mission trip I was on in 2009 in Washington, D.C. We were taking a group of students, and uh, my co-leader and I were getting the students prepped for their day, and they were going all over the city. And one group was going to this kind of community living center. And I don't remember if it was for seniors or those maybe transitioning out of homelessness or whatever it was, but I got the impression it wasn't the nicest place. But the students were going to be there for several hours and they'd be eating lunch while they're there. And my co-leader very assertively looked at all the kids and said, you are not too good to eat their food. You are not too good to eat their food. See, a lot of the students we were with were very fluent. Back home, they lived in million-dollar homes. that They went to private school, and so my leader was trying to check that sort of superior feeling at the door. 
And I never forgot that. And so that first part of that phrase, you are not too good for blank, helps keep me a little grounded. And when I think, when I start to think a little bit too highly of myself, I think of that story. The other thing about being a slave this time, there was zero reward in it. There's no honor in being a slave. They didn't get a prize or glory. And so Jesus challenges not to serve or do hard work because we want the glory or recognition or praise. That's why he got so frustrated with the disciples because they were so focused and consumed on that glory that wasn't even theirs to have that they forgot what they were really called to do and called to be. So let's bring this here to Christ United. Now we have endless opportunities to serve. So many things. We could talk a long time about all the ways we can serve, but I want to focus on just a few of them. So we have this group called MSG, which stands for Men's Service Group, and they meet monthly. And often they kind of go under the radar, but they do so much for this church, for our community, for our members, and they have a whole list of skills they have, but mainly it's Think of like being a handyman and they do yard work and all that kind of stuff. But they do it because they really just love people. They want to serve people. They want to do out of the kindness of their heart and they don't ask for reward. They don't get paid for it. And again, they do a lot of things that none of us even realize they do. They're an example of people that serve because they just have this genuine love for other people. And if you'd like to be part of this group, I can get you connected. Even if you aren't good with tools, they would love to teach you. Your wives would love for you to learn to use tools, I'm sure. (laughs) We're also really big on mentoring here at Christ United. We've had a strong relationship with Dooley Elementary for a while, and now we added Frankfurt Middle School this past year. And both have opportunities to invest in students through tutoring, mentoring, ESL classes, providing supplies and support to both teachers and students, or being part of the Kindness Club at Frankfurt. I mean, Kindness Club, come on. And a lot of this only requires about an hour a week. Maybe you're working from home and you can get away during your lunch hour and go be part of the Kindness Club at Frankfurt. A lot of these things are really easy to do and I know that the kids need you I look at this scripture again about Jesus saying we need to welcome kids we need to be about kids and serving them again is through genuine love genuine care for our students we also have this wonderful ministry called Project Hope and hope is this Project Hope is this I mean, it's this incredible ministry where we get to walk alongside people from our community um, and their children often and break, often breaking cycles of, of poverty and different things like that. We help them achieve goals and their dreams. We, we coach them. We give them accountability. We tutor. We show up. We listen. We give them access to resources and tools. And again, it's through this genuine love. We're all about equipping Uh, and sending our friends off to a better future. And you can be part of it here at Christ United. In a few minutes, we'll even watch a video about this ministry and how it's impacted and changed the lives of so many. The thing I love about our team, our staff, and our volunteers is the way we walk with them. It's not this us versus them, which sometimes serving can be like that. (laughs) Oh, let's go help them. But we're going to stay over here. The way Project Hope cares and loves is not this sort of superior thing. It's not because we're better than anyone else. I love that mentality. We're just here to serve. Our church models this really well. There's so many people in this church that do things that never get recognition. Things that happen off hours or, um, and off campus, and they just do it because they love God and they love others and they know they're called to serve. See, we serve because it's not about bettering ourselves. It's about bettering the world around us. Stewardship is giving of ourselves through money, through, through gifts, through time, through presence and service. But remembering why we do all that is important, not for glory not for recognition, not for power, but because of this genuine love 
for people and for God. Now, we won't all get to be like Johnny Kim. (laughs) I don't know if he did all those things because he wanted recognition or maybe because he really wanted to do some research and be the best doctor or he wants to help us find other ways to live or sources from the moon. I don't know. I don't know what his motivation is. But I know many of us will really work hard and get no recognition or we won't be remembered in books. No one will know our name. But I hope we never forget that the hard work, living a life of service is always worth it. And it's what we're called to do, even if we don't get to go to the moon. Let's pray. God, I know we can be convicted of doing things because we want that recognition. How can we be talked about? How can we have sort of fame? And so we're thankful for these stories that humble us and remind us that's not what it's about. It's never about us. It's always about you. It's always about loving others. You were such a different kind of leader in the way that you wanted to serve and you did not want to be served. And you had every right (laughs) to demand it. We're sorry for the times that we lose sight of that. So help build in us this heart to serve, to love, to go out and to care because we just want to and that's what we're called to do. God, at times there are so many things on our hearts and our minds and sometimes we mess up and we struggle, but we're so thankful for your grace that we can come back and start fresh and start new. And maybe serving and just dipping our toe in serving is a great way to start. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being patient with us. And as we join together as a community of faith, let us pray the prayer that your son taught us saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 